Sorry about that technical glitch, back again. Okay, um, as I was saying, I'm hoping today's session can have a fairly informal feel and that you guys are gonna feel comfortable enough to contribute your, your own experiences and share questions. You can do that by typing questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, the way the format is gonna work is that I'll do a quick 10 minute introduction, uh, introducing some themes. Um, then we'll have each of the speakers in turn and after each speaker, there'll be a 10 minute session of questions and answers. And that after each uh, Q&A session, there'll also be a five minute break. So that you have a chance to go and get a cup of tea or whatever. Um, so uh, that's about it. I think um, before we start, I'd just like to thank the speakers for, for being with us today. I'd also like to thank uh, UKRN for making this event possible and for providing the technical support. Um, so big thanks in particular to Marcus and Will at UKRN. Uh, and without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen and get started on my intro. Just bear with me. So I'm hoping you can all see that okay. Uh, to kick off the session, I wanted to talk about the field of archaeology, which I'm studying in my PhD work. And rather than looking at specific examples of open scholarship, I wanted to try and bring out some broad themes, uh, which I think have relevance to open scholarship practices in the humanities and the arts in general. I think, um, in some ways, archaeology maybe can be a canary in the coal mine for other humanities disciplines. And in particular, it gives us a useful model for other disciplines which might be looking to integrate scientific techniques or scientific theoretical approaches into their research repertoires. I think there's probably a natural tendency to follow the example of more established open scholarship practices and as I understand it, these are often inspired by the reproducibility agenda uh, and work carried out in controlled experimental circumstances. So it's important to consider whether these approaches can work in the context of the humanities. For example, with the exploitation of new accesses to data and data manipulation tools. So archeology span is at heart, it's really a social science because it's about human culture or human cultures. Uh, so the potential of scientific techniques for making archaeological knowledge claims has always been a big uh, debating point in the discipline. Not just techniques, but the use of the scientific method itself. And the pendulum swung towards a very positivist approach in the 1960s, with an emphasis on the objective testability of hypotheses, uh, hypotheses from eth ethnographical studies. Uh, so it was thought that these were testable via the systematic analysis of evidence. But the pendulum then swung back in the 80s to an emphasis on the situated nature of knowledge and the idea that researchers bring their own perspectives and subjectivity to research and that knowledge is constructed rather than uncovered. And since then, there's been a kind of moderation of the more extreme positions in the discipline and a kind of uneasy truce where focused scientific analysis sit alongside more interpretative modes and, and often help to inform those. But what I think is interesting is um, the extended processes of negotiation 
uh, that have happened around the, new, the uses of new technologies in archaeology. Carbon-14 dating, for example, it was at first it was seen as like being a virtual barcode for on every organic object which could give an objective accurate date of provenance but over the years it turned out that c14 dates they couldn't actually be considered self-warranting they couldn't stand as independent foundational measures ironically they had to be corrected and recalibrated using other measures of chronological progress like tree ring analysis these were the kind of measures that it was actually intended to displace. And they also had to be understood as probabilistic measures rather than absolute ones. And then, of course, they needed to be put into context with interpretative scholarship. So to mention this is not to undermine the validity of these scientific methods, but it's more to point out the positive potential of examining evidence from a range of independent perspectives. One argument goes that the strength of the science is directly related to the diversity of the disciplines engaged with it. So we have the central metaphor of a cable of knowledge, which is given strength by winding together these compatible but independent threads. And it seems to me that open scholarship could present new opportunities for bringing together different methodologies and discourses and exploring whether they can be complementary. But if that is part of an open scholarship agenda, um, perhaps we should be asking what the epist epistemological commitment of the research is and what the motivation is behind using open scholarship methods and what distinguishes open humanities from open science, for example. And perhaps a useful starting point is to frame things in this, using this basic dichotomy of universal foundational knowledge models on the one hand and situated knowledge models on the other hand. So in, in open humanities, are we taking a sort of single solution jigsaw puzzle approach, a bit like working on knowledge as though it was a single open source software package while working collectively to try and fix the bugs in it? Or is the idea that we're working in a dynamic knowledge commons accepting that having a range of different perspectives can be useful for revealing the limitations of individual approaches, as well as for building robust knowledge claims from diverse sources. Or perhaps we have other more straightforward imperatives, like more transparency, greater inclusivity, better sharing, better access to data and to feedback. I think it's useful uh, to be aware of the agency of the tools and the methods that we're working with and how they shape the process and the outcomes. And there's some nice examples in archaeology of how this happens. In archaeology, the record itself is much an object of study as the, as the site which is excavated, mainly because the site is often effectively destroyed when it's excavated, so all that's left to be interpreted is the site record, so the documentation. And historians of archaeology have suggested that digs actually came to resemble the conventional diagrammatic representations of them. So the representation conventions ended up shaping the process of digging. It happens in a very symbiotic way. Then we have like, the use of computers for creating 3D visualizations, uh, in this case, reconstructions. This led to a point of crisis in archaeology when it became apparent that computer-based reconstructions often gave a misleading sense of authority because they actually looked too real. They didn't show traces of authorship or communicate their hypothetical status in the way that hand-drawn illustration does, for example. And the response to this was attempts by academics to try to codify the inclusion of uncertainty and the details of the research process itself into research outputs. And I would suggest that an open scholarship approach is really well suited to sharing contextual information about research processes and assumptions, or paradata as it's called in archaeology. And this might in fact form a core part of the practice rather than being a corrective add-on. This raises the, the, the notion of replicability and reproducibility in the context of the humanities. And 
maybe in that context that that concept should be less about reproducing results and more about making research context and assumptions more transparent so that we can properly assess how independent the different strands of the cable, the metaphorical cable are. So it may be possible to adapt tools from, from science like electronic lab notebooks to, towards this end. And this is a point where I put in a quick plug for a software project I'm working on, um, which is designed for documenting research uh, projects and, and the, the research process. So another narrative in archaeological research is that data focused approaches can bring us closer to truth and that previously unseen patterns can be revealed in data at scale. And it's certainly very clear that archaeology has benefited greatly from improved access to research data uh, via digital networks and open access repositories. But that is a different phenomenon than the perceived virtues of big data as it's typically known. So perhaps a more appropriate name for that, this wider access would be broad data. And uh, you know, open access is surely a great facilitator of that. But how do we make use of data? Historians in archaeology have noted a tendency to draw a clear distinction between facts and interpretations. Facts have often been seen as unchanging, while the, the interpretations are the things that uh, could evolve or change. But obviously, uh, you know, this notion of data as being raw and somehow independent of research practice and bias, as of, co as of course, that's been widely challenged. And uh, meaning doesn't emerge just unprompted from data sets, no matter how big they are. Um, and as Jeremy Huggett says, just because a data set is large does not mean it's representative or unbiased. Methodological issues are even more important when you have large and disparate data sets. I thought this was a useful quotation uh, to bring in. Um, the writer laments what he calls the fetishization of data in archaeology. And he says that the scientific turn in archaeology comes with a price that remains largely overlooked, namely that archaeology's approximation to science has produced a growing suspicion towards interpretations that cannot be scientifically proven or quantified objectively. I believe that the increasing suspicion of unquantifiable occurrences in archaeology generates an unhelpful return to the ethos of letting data speak for itself, because, as the popular legend goes, facts do not lie and thus become associated with truth. And he goes on to say that forcing scientific methods onto otherwise ambiguous archaeological research topics often leads to the careless use of scientific data and to a distorted notion of interdisciplinarity. In practice, if we actually look at the tools that archaeologists are using in the digital age and the models that they build, often the, the more subjective aspects of interpretation and the embodied aspects of knowing the world are passed over in favor of projects to create universal models and classifications which will make that data interoperable and processable by computers. And this inevitably removes some of the particularities of the circumstances of how the, da the data was re retrieved in the first place, the situated aspects of knowledge. So as a result, perhaps the, the attempts to make diverse data, diverse data sets interoperable could be seen as a journey towards increased abstraction rather than one which gets closer to the detail of the evidence and its context and the implications that are associated with those. And then the metaphor of the cable of knowledge, this might lead to less robust conclusions because the number of strands contributing to the hypothesis is reduced. So uh, I'm actually going to stop there. Um, I haven't mentioned publishing models and digital collaboration, but I think those topics will be covered well by other speakers in the session. I hope some of those themes might be useful for framing some, some of the discussion uh, 
and then helping to introduce some of the, the topics from other speakers. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're running a little bit late already. So I'm immediately going to hand over to, um, well, first of all, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Melody Beals. She's a senior lecturer in digital history and the open research lead for the School of Social Sciences and Humanities at Loughborough University. And her research explores the ways in which the movement of peoples and ideas intersect and the practical traces, whoops, the practical traces of imagined communities within the Anglophone world. So over to you, Melody. Thank you very much, Mike, and, and thank you very much to the, the UKRN for, for hosting this workshop, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about humane reproducibility, which is my way of sort of framing the concept of reproducible data, reproducible methodologies, and reproducible research in general within the humanities. So, uh, I want to begin sort of with my background just for 30 seconds. I began life in academia in a liberal arts college. So although nominally a historian at that point, taking a history degree, it was very much informed by um, theater and film, literature, art history, um, all sorts of different humanities languages that were part of my degree. When I went on to do my PhD at Glasgow, I was in the arts history department. Um, Glasgow has the sort of notability of having both a um, social and economic history department and an arts history department. And then through my career, I've been in various humanities and social science departments. So I definitely do have a perspective of going back and forth between those two um, meta categories of disciplines. But I am going to be speaking today primarily as a humanities historian, because as much as social science methods have informed my own personal research, I think my heart and soul still kind of lives in the humanities. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, it'll be clear why. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is what makes the humanities different? What makes the humanities unique or special in terms of reproducible research? And I think one of the things that people often bring up is the fact that um, in the humanities experimental research, where you set up a scientific method sort of um, research paradigm is less common. I won't say it never happens because you do get experimental research in the humanities, but it is more common to refer to it as observational research. We go and we look at existing materials and we try to interpret, understand, contextualize, analyze all of these eyes words. And in a way that kind of makes it distinct from the sciences, but as this image hopefully indicates, it's not distinct from all the sciences. And in fact, there is a really strong kinship with certain sciences such as astronomy. And I will come back to this paradigm of astronomical science over and over again throughout this presentation. And it's this idea that um, you can't just create a new star or constellation in your laboratory. You have to rely on data that is, exists out there, that is messy, that is uncertain, and that you can't necessarily reproduce in a lab. And that's how historians, literary scholars, and, and a lot of other humanities um, scholars really do feel about their research. The other thing that's very interesting about humanities is this forefront of subjective hermeneutics. And Again, it is the prominence we give to that. It's not actually unique to the humanities. Interpretation is a core part of the sciences as well, but it's something that we sort of particularly pride ourselves on, that you can look at the same novel a thousand different ways, a million different ways. Everyone who reads it will get something different out of it. There are uncountable stories in our historical record that we can look at every perspective. And in a way, it is the subjectivity of the historian or the literary scholar or the linguist or the philologist that sort of dictates how that research comes about. So again, that kind of is like, well, that's that's different from reproducibility. We kind of pride ourselves on that level of subjectivity. The other thing that I think is super important though, that kind of 
balances this observational subjective research is the idea of the canon. Now, the canon has unfortunately got a little bit of a bad name recently. I think it's very undeserved. Um, the canon is very, very important to humanities research. It gives us a common language, a common point of reference. And this is not necessarily culture specific. Um, these sorts of connections in lots of different cultures, lots of different countries, parts of the world and histories are critical to understanding the history, the literature, the language, the art of these different um, locations and periods. And we don't have to start our data from scratch, essentially, every time we can make reference and allusions to these things. And again, this isn't unique to the humanities. There is a canon of models, the standard model in physics, that other disciplines do engage with. But ours is, again, a much less um, deterministic model base in that same way that you see in the sciences. It's much more narratively based. So with all that in mind, what kind of dissuades humanities researchers from the concept of open research, even if I think quite a lot of people do actively engage with it on a day to day basis. Um, first is the narrative compositional style of most humanities research. Now there's two ways of kind of explaining that you have narrative of the content where in history, you tell the story of one event to the next or in literature, the plot of the novel or the plot of the play or the development of certain artistic techniques. Um, but it is very much a, a, a story, a narrative. More recently, you have the, the journey of the scholar. So it's sort of, if you think of more recent documentaries where you have the presenter kind of learn about the topic as the documentary goes on in a kind of fictitious narrative of discovery. Again, this is very narratively composed as opposed to the standard way you look at a physics or a biology journal article where you have methodology set up, um, conclusions, results, discussions. That's its own different type of narrative, but it's much more formulaic and model-like than the sort of story-based um, writing style. The other thing that really counterintuitively affects um, open research is this dichotomy between copyright and public domain. Um, I know this affects art historians in particular. Um, you can read a lot of art history journal articles, sometimes even books with absolutely no images in them because copyright is so difficult to obtain to kind of analyze those materials. Um, and on the other hand, people like myself who deal with 19th century text, there's sort of an assumption that, oh, it's in the public domain. If you want to go look at this book or this newspaper, just go look at it. I don't have to provide you my data. It's already out there. And in both of these cases that I can't and I don't need to kind of dissuade humanities researchers from understanding the value of open research and open data. And I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. And finally, and this is something that will be touched upon, I'm sure, by our other speakers, when it comes to publication, there is a sense in the humanities, first of all, long form publication, monographs as opposed to journal articles, which don't fit neatly into funding cycles or even discrete data sets or research projects. But even more than a monograph, you have long form longitudinal research, a lifetime of research. You think of Toynbee or of Gibbon, and you have these multi-volume histories that take 20 years to create. And it's much more difficult to kind of wrangle your evidence in that kind of packaged format in the same way that sometimes we associate with reproducible research when it's a lifetime of reading, a lifetime of coffee room conversations, of conferences, of deep thoughts and ivory towers. So all of these kind of dissuade a lot of historians and literary scholars and art historians from engaging with open research in the first place. Does the digital fix the problem? Well, some people say yes. Having digital research, digital humanities, digital history fixes all of these problems because as soon as you have to program your materials, there you go. You have your documentation of your methodology. You have all of your data that you put through these computational processes. And I think that is a little bit naive. Um, it's just, it kind of rings of scientivism for me where it gives the gloss, a sciency gloss to the humanities. But in a lot of ways, it 
either hides the true work of the humanity scholar where they're doing that sort of hermeneutic um, interpretive work of the data. So much of the data cleaning is completely undocumented. Um, choosing the methodology is often completely undocumented. And it really does create a sense that you're changing historians into something that they aren't typically um, trained to do. It also really raises the hackles of a lot of people because it raises the specter of what was once called the bitch goddess, which is quantification. This idea that you're turning human beings into numbers and somehow um, removing them of their humanity, their color, their life, their under being able to understand them by turning them into numbers. And I think that there are so many benefits to quantification, but it has to be done with the utmost care to prevent losing what makes the humanity special in that sort of longitudinal, hugely interdisciplinary view of these materials. But I think there's hope. I think there's lots of hope for reproducible research in the humanities, first and foremost, because we have really good role models for reproducibility, especially in literature and history. And I say that not because there aren't good role models in other disciplines, but just because those are the two that I'm particularly trained in. Um, we have 4,000 or more years of reproducible research that we can turn to and say, hey, this is how they've been doing it for millennia. Um, first and foremost, historical studies, and I mean that in the broadest possible sense, I consider um, the Iliad and the Odyssey historical works, even though they're quite clearly poetic um, literary works as well. There is a huge legacy of empiricism. And I make the really clear distinction here of empirical thought as defined by Sextus Empiricus or David Hume. Um, this idea that it's not that there is a deterministic data-driven model to how history plays out. You put in a certain situation, you'll know exactly how it'll end up, but rather that you go through and you look across time and instances for patterns of behavior, patterns of outcomes. And I think if we go right back to the beginning of some of the earliest historical works we have, people like Herodotus and his histories, it's a profoundly empirical work. He gives us these beautiful narrative, fascinating stories about the Persian Wars and ancient cultures in Egypt, Thrace, Greece, Persia. And he gives story after story in a narrative fashion, but the point is to show the models of behavior. If one does this, this is what will happen. And that's profoundly empirical. It's not, this is why it happens or necessarily even how it happens, simply that it happens. And if you get enough examples, you can see patterns in the course of human events. It's also profoundly empirical because People like Herodotus and many other ancient historians give a lot of weight to the voice of common people. It's their stories, their folk understanding of what's going on. The common soldier um, in the Persian War is given an active voice the same as Darius or any of the, the kings of Athens or Sparta. And I think the point of all of this is that we should not be trying to look at the humanities and try to create experiments where we can find the ones and the zeros of the perfect formula, but to understand that we have thousands of years of historiography to help us understand cause and effect and how to understand that in a messy, fuzzy, but really useful and robust way. It's much more um, robust than having a single formula that will break at every other um, instance. We also have hundreds, if not thousands of years of how to cite our sources. Um, footnotes may only be a couple of hundred years old, but we're very good at saying where we got the information from, why it may or may not be authoritative, multiple viewpoints and what may have um, influenced them. We have lots of examples of how to document that interpretive process, not just data collection or raw data processing, but documentation and reproducibility of our interpretation. And I'll, I'll leave this thought with the idea of Michel Foucault. Um, in an interview he gave, one of the questions was, 
there's a lot of pieces in your, your work that are essentially direct quotations from Marx that you've not put in quotation marks, you've not footnoted, you know, it raises kind of the specter of plagiarism. And Foucault says that if you are going to read my work, obviously you'll have read Karl Marx. And if you've read Karl Marx, it'll be obvious that I am alluding to him when I make these statements, as opposed to coming up with something unique myself. And this is something I think we've lost a lot in the humanities recently, is this idea that there is an obvious canon. There is a series of authors, maybe not the best historians or the only historians, but they're points of reference that people who grew up in different places or at different times can all point to. I read Herodotus and Tacitus the same as Macaulay and Gibbon did. And because of that, we can understand each other in a way, despite being separated by hundreds of years. So we should nonetheless take advantage of the fact that we live in 2021 as opposed to in 1790 or 500 BC. And the digital age offers us quite a few opportunities, which my co-speakers will probably talk quite a bit about. Um, first of all, we have the digital public domain. There is so much material that was once only accessible in sort of the basement of the British Museum or the British Library. And it's just available now that people can look to it, they can incorporate it into their data sets, and you can reference it that way. You have permalinks and precise citations. So you no longer have to put a little footnote to a general volume and hope somebody can, can find the same edition and understand how you came to that conclusion, how you document that interpretation, but you can actually use URLs and permalinks to cite particular passages, particular segments of an image. All of these things allow people to understand your interpretation in a way that was not physically possible with the limitations of print publication previously. You also have a sense of infinite extensibility. So if I make a data set, I have a data set on newspaper reprinting. I'm particularly interested in hard news, facts and reportage. But in my data set, I have hundreds of thousands of instances of advertisements being reprinted. I do not care about advertising history. I think it's interesting, but it's not my area of research. But by making my data available, and hopefully in the future making it um, directly editable in a way through versioning, people can add layers and layers of metadata. So someone might annotate a, uh, a novel or a poem, somebody might annotate it with an entirely different perspective or looking for different types of indicators. And you can seamlessly layer those together electronically, compare and contrast. And it's never going to be kind of a Von Ronka perfect a culm um, culmination of all knowledge in one place, but it is a really interesting way of essentially having everyone in the room who's read the same text or looked at the same image and having their interpretations and their thoughts layerable with each other. And again, it's not reproducibility in an experimental sense, but it gives key documentation to understanding the interpretive elements that people have put into those texts or images or performances. So when I talk about humane reproducibility, I think I really want to highlight a couple of really key factors to what that means to me. First, um, as Mike sort of indicated, you have lots of different disciplines and all of those different disciplines have different strengths and different things, I won't say weaknesses, but different things that they're not as interested in pursuing or looking at. Um, if we look at the sciences, you could say that physiology is really just biology. And biology in a lot of ways is just chemistry. And chemistry, if you really get down to the core of it, is just physics. And physics, Newtonian physics, well, that's really just quantum physics. So really, our doctors and nurses should be studying quantum physics because that's the best version of science for helping us. And of course, we would think that was a ridiculous idea. And the same is true within the humanities and in the relationship with the social sciences and the physical sciences. History is at the resolution of the course of human events, lifetimes, dynasties, but you also have archaeology, which deals in much longer periods of time, geography, geology, which deals in huge lengths of time. 
sociology, which deals at the re resolution of societies or large groups rather than individual human events. All these things are valuable and they all kind of bleed and borrow from each other, but we don't want to lose the distinctiveness because it gives us different resolutions, different perspectives. I can learn things about a society through sociological methods that I can't through history, but I can also learn a lot through history that I can't learn through sociology. And this is shown with things like the um, land bridge theories going from Asia to North America over Beringia, the archaeology, the genetics, the um, cultural oral histories, they all tell slightly different stories and they need to be built together to create a cohesive whole. Um, humane reproducibility also has biases, I suppose, or purposes, teleologies. And that is memorializing virtue and vice. All the way back to the ancient Sumerian stories that we have records of, the idea of history is to learn from it, not necessarily to repeat it or to absolutely avoid it in a deterministic scientific way, but to understand that certain behaviors, certain courses of human events have certain repercussions. And Herodotus and Thucydides and Tacitus, they all sort of begin their great works with this idea that we need to remember the great and the good for the moral things they did. And we need to remember the wicked to you know, punish and to avoid those behaviors in the future. And all of this, all of these different methodologies we've developed basically allow us to create patterns and comparative models across time and space. And that for me is what reproducibility is, is that documentation of how we came to understand what a revolution is, what a um, political coup d'etat is. We have definitions for these words, but they're based upon stories, on examples, and understanding that filiological element is really important. So I guess I will conclude with the um, eternal relevancy of the humane and the humanities. Um, whatever happens over the course of human events, um, the humanities always do seem to bounce back, and that's because they strike an important chord. It's not just it's good to cuddle up with a book beside a cozy fire on a cold winter night. It's that it has an absolute relevance to the core of who we are as people through those stories and through that understanding of how we come to interpret or to make use of those stories in our daily lives. And um, this really impressive statue of Genghis Khan is apparently very difficult to get to. This travel blogger had to basically hitchhike through Mongolia in order to get to it. Um, but she seems very excited. And I watch people in the streets of London, various pieces, places in the UK and the US, and they stop by statues and memorials and little blue plaques because these stories really do affect individuals in very interesting ways. So I'm 100% wanting to support um, reproducibility in the humanities, but I want to make sure that we don't lose what's important about the humanities, but instead we protect it through reproducibility so it doesn't get lost. These methodologies don't get forgotten because we just stopped writing them down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melody, for a really thought-provoking presentation. That was great. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. Uh, you could use the hand-raising feature in Zoom. Okay, we have a, a question from, is it Dovit? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, Dovit Brun, uh, also, yeah, University of Glasgow. So, hello, Melody. Um, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, I was just um, um, wanting to ask a couple of things about uh, the, the digital and the history uh, dimensions of what you were discussing. Um, one of it, one of them is, um, you know, taking sort of taking a more sort of opportunity to take a more open view about uh, the sort of thing you've been talking about uh, and essentially the narrative uh, dimension of history. Um, so, for example, um, myself and uh, Joe Tucker did some work on uh, how a database 
can be used so that you're providing the people of medieval Scotland in this case, so that intentionally we're trying to create a, a resource for other people to create their own narratives. So it's sort of endlessly reproducible in, in that sense, rather than us as historians telling people what we thought uh, may have happened. So a sort of dynamic in which the researcher is the facilitator rather than the authority in the sense of get, producing the finished uh, product. Uh, so that was one question about whether there is therefore opportunities to rethink um, reproducibility in a, even more deeply than what you were um, talking about. And my second uh, dimension of this is thinking about, for example, uh, sort of manuscript studies, something else I'm involved with. Um, and there's an increasing awareness that, you know, digital images, we used to refer to them as if we were looking at the manuscript itself, but, but plainly we're not. Um, and it's just the um, opportunities to be more aware of how we are actually inter interacting with things. So we're not actually looking at the real manuscript itself and then thinking about the image and how it was produced and the decisions that we made about cropping and, uh, you know, um, DPIs and, and so on and so forth and crediting the people who have, uh, who have done that for us. So that was just a couple of thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... So the, the idea of um, facilitating additional narratives through data provision, I guess, is the most compact way I can say that. Um, first of all, I think it's great. I, I think that um, the whole point of reproducible, reproducible research is not just that people understand how you came to your interpretation, but they have the tools and the ability to come to different whether that's slightly nuanced or radically different interpretations of the same data. And uh, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's important that we do not um, absent ourselves from our interpretive roles. Um, we are extraordinarily privileged to be humanities academics and to have had access, um, privileged access in a lot of ways to additional reading and additional training. And so I think just providing data is um has difficulties i think we also have a, a duty to provide very extremely thoughtfully documented and hedged or nuanced interpretations along with that so um i think it's a balancing act i think if we just throw the data out there um history isn't just the historical information literature isn't just the the text um i'm going against maybe some people it is more than just the text um, we, we need to not lose hold of ways of thinking as well. Um, and those can be countered and they can be um, fought over. But I, I think we have a duty to, you know, show why we think the way we do and, and that we think certain ways. Because for all of our best efforts, our data set is going to be a subselection as well. And if we're honest about our interpretations, it gives hints as to why we maybe unconsciously selected the data we did or gave the metadata that we did. So I think um, if, although giving an interpretation is like being authoritative in some ways, not giving an interpretation makes the data seem more authoritative than it really is when it is a product of selection bias and survival bias as well. So I think we need to, to have that narrative voice as well. And just in terms of being honest about what you actually read, please, please, everyone should do this. If you read a PDF or you read something um, electronically, these are different editions. And the same way that you would have to write which edition of a book you read, you would say what electronic edition you have, especially for primary sources, um, because those are heavily edited just in terms of um, resolution. Um, you'll see things or you won't see things because of the way the image has been processed. So um, I 100% agree with that. And I think you should always put the most precise citation you possibly can and, and be honest about it because there's there's nothing wrong with looking at the electronic or the hard copy version, <laughs> just be honest. We've still got time for more questions from Elodie. Um, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I'll just mention some of the comments which have been appearing. We've got Mark uh, Erickson saying quantification is a problem in the natural sciences too. Paul Nurse writing in Nature last week made a strong plea for more theory, quoting a colleague, we're drowning in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. 
Thanks for that, Mark. And uh, we also got uh, Natasha mentioning a frustration with changing permalinks and permalinks expiring after two or three years, meaning that all the references in her in her PhD became outdated. Uh, yeah, thanks for that thought as well. Um, I was wondering, um, Melody, just getting back to the, this idea about digital management of sources, is there a danger of crossing over into the world of the digital humanities when we, can, we become too interested in the, the methods and the technologies that we use uh, to manage our sources digitally? Um, or you know, what is it that's going to make humanities distinctive from digital digital humanities? You know, if we're talking about open scholarship practices. Yeah, it's an interesting question. There was a, a, a couple of colleagues I had a few years ago who said, I don't want to be a digital humanities scholar. I want to be a humanities scholar. And by that, they meant um, they wanted digital to become the norm. They didn't want to be made distinct anymore. Like, this is how we do humanities research now. And in, in a way, I, I sort of applauded their um, their boldness in saying this. Um, but I think they, there are distinctions um, about methodologies. And what I was trying to get across in this paper is that um, reproducibility is something that is at the core of these disciplines already. And the digitization may facilitate it. It may you know, branch off into a different discipline entirely. Um, culturenomics, for example, I've been reading lots of culturenomics um, articles recently, which are nominally historical textual studies in the digital humanities, but they are so methodologically removed from anything that I would consider historical or periodical research that I don't really recognize them. I, I continue to think that they're valid to exist, but they are distinct. So um, digital publishing and digital documentation allows access to what I think are still fundamentally traditional and very deeply um, developed methodologies. So I would say there is a there's a core distinction between using the leveraging the digital to publicize or document humanities research and engaging in computationally aided research, which are new methodologies, new ways, new perspectives of looking at things. And they're both great, but they are distinct things. Sure. Thanks. Um... Yeah, if I, if I may, I'll just raise another quick question. Um, is that you talked about historiography in, in terms of cause and effect. And um, I wonder if, um, do you think, uh, when people think about open scholarship, they maybe feel a bit daunted by the sense that they're, they, they have to try and demonstrate cause and effect, or they have to show some kind of deductive method by sharing their, their sources. Right. Yeah. So this this again is is one of the things that is so off putting, I think, in the humanities about open research. Um, there are absolutely positivistic historians who believe in deductive and deterministic historical scholarship. I am not one of those. Um, I definitely still feel um, very strong kinship with the empiricist tradition. Um, so. I don't think that documentation and reproducibility necessarily means um, deterministic. One of the chats you mentioned was talking about theory. We have a history and theory journal that has been around for decades and decades. People have been talking about historiographical theory, maybe as far back as the Greeks, but certainly to people like Khaldun in the Middle Ages. Um, what these theories and these modes of, of thinking are like. So, um, yeah, we, we need to not be worried about all theory being deterministic. Um, theory is just a model. There are lots of different models that can explain the same data, and it's just about which models help us understand things at which resolutions and in which situations. So I would say that, um, yeah, the, in, in the very end, in terms of cause and effect, you're still telling that something followed something else, and you think there's a pattern or you think there's a connection, but it's it's never meant to be Newtonian physics, but for human behavior. Great. 
Okay, th thanks again, Melody. Right, we're going to stop there for now and we'll take a five minute break. So we're running about 10 minutes over schedule. That's, that's fine. We can hopefully make that up at the end. Um, so yeah, everyone come back in five minutes, please. And uh, we'll go to the next presentation at that point. everybody. That's the recording started again. Welcome back everyone. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce uh, Dr. Amy Milligan. She's an associate publisher for Humanities and Social Sciences at F1000, which is a provider of open research publishing solutions and services. So I'll pass over to you now, Amy. Hello everyone, let me just get started sharing my screen. Somebody let me know if that's worked perhaps. Yep, looks good. Great, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I want to begin by thanking Mike Kelly and the UK Reproducibility Network for organizing this workshop and for inviting me to participate. As a publisher and a historian who studies the publishing industry, I'm doubly interested in the publishing of scholarly research in the humanities and social sciences. In the interests of full disclosure, I currently serve as associate publisher for humanities and social sciences at F1000. <clears throat> F1000 is an open access scholarly publishing platform uh, which stipulates fair open data excuse me, <clears throat> and offers open post-publication peer review. F1000 began primarily as a publisher of medical and life sciences. Uh, as medical and life sciences, but is actively building a profile in the social sciences. It's now also a division of Taylor and Francis, which is one of the largest publishers of humanities and social sciences scholarship in the world. But I'm not here to advocate for any particular publisher or journal. I'm really interested in exploring how publishers can support open research and open access in the humanities and social sciences by creating a scholarly publishing framework that fits the outputs generated by researchers in these disciplines. If we can develop this kind of a framework, then I believe publishing open research can support authors, accelerate research, and amplify impact. The 
The open research movement proposes that scholars should strive for openness throughout the research cycle by encouraging and acknowledging collaborative working, sharing methodologies and research tools, <clears throat> enabling others to access and reuse data, and especially by publishing outputs, open access. Scientists have developed a number of methods for sharing the different stages of their research, and publishers are enabling them to publish a wide range of their research outputs. Protocols, clinical trials, software tools, data, data notes, case studies. But are any of these article types relevant to scholars in the arts and humanities? Does the way we, as scholars in these disciplines, does the way we conduct and publish our research allow for openness on the same basis? And if it doesn't, can we develop our own research projects based around a uniquely open humanities approach to research and scholarly communication? One of the first things to consider are the primary goals of research projects in the humanities versus the sciences. What do scholars in the sciences produce and what do scholars in the humanities produce? What are the outcomes you would expect to see from a major research project in the arts and humanities? Uh, let's do a quick straw poll. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the most likely outcomes of, uh, of a research project in these areas? Or perhaps what are you working towards yourself? What would your institution or funding agency expect of a major project in your field? Uh, let's see if I can find the chat. <laughs> there it is. Uh, <laughs> I've lost the chat function. Maybe somebody could pop that link into the chat so everybody could access it easily. I'll, tr I'll try and type it in, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, it. sorry. I haven't tested it, but let's see if it works. <laughs> yep. Great. So <clears throat> as you type in your answers, they should appear <clears throat> here. Um, and the word cloud should reflect uh, your suggestions with the largest phrases representing the answers you input most often. There we go. Some people are inputting answers, so we'll leave that up for a second. It looks like one of the largest um, words on, on this slide so far is monograph, which you would expect. Uh, articles, edited collection, an exhibition, book chapters, definitely. And these, and databases, that's good to see. Uh, so these are all uh, outcomes that you would expect to see from a major research project in the arts and humanities. Scholars in the sciences, uh, and particularly in life and health sciences, do produce monographs sometimes, but they tend to prioritize research articles in journals over longer formats. Scholars in the arts and humanities, as indeed Melody touched on earlier, uh, often are more focused on longer formats, producing a monograph rather than articles. This isn't a criticism in any way. In fact, this approach can allow scholars to take a deeper dive into a subject to explore nuances that the rapid output of a short article might not support. Monographs can also feature prominently uh, in the evaluations of arts and humanities researchers applying for new positions, research grants, or those who are working towards tenure. Just come back to the... Oops. 
hopefully come back to the PowerPoint there. Uh, the prominence of the monograph does have some implications for open access publication though, and for open research more generally. Open access monographs are prohibitively, prohibitively expensive most of the time, and funder and institution expectations about open access and open data can be less stringent when it comes to monographs. So there can be less incentive to choose open research, open access, or open peer review models. There are some new experiments which are attempting to address some of these problems, such as open book publishers, the Open Foundation, that's O-A-P-E-N for open access publishing in European networks, and the Flip It Open scheme from Cambridge University Press. A new initiative from Routledge, Taylor and Francis and F1000, which I think is really interesting is Open Plus Books. And this pilot project experiments with the format of open books, combining traditional print model with the open research format developed by F1000. Authors can publish chapters individually or in total, and each will appear within days of submission. All will benefit from the same transparency and openness as the rest of F1000, and chapters will include interactive figures and underlying data, uh, enabling visualization, interaction, reanalysis, application, and reuse. Moreover, authors can choose open post-publication peer review and can create new versions of their chapters in response to this feedback or to update on new developments in the field. Some of these alternative models show promise, um, but how many authors will choose them, or in the case of CUP's uh, Cambridge scheme, uh, how many authors will be chosen? Well, that remains to be seen. So traditional print monographs can and sometimes do engage with open research. Authors share data, for example, and publishers offer online supplements with additional figures, tables, indexes, data, and so on. But the long gestation period for monographs, as they're researched and written by scholars, and then as they wait in publishing queues, means that all of this post-publication engagement can be delayed by months or years. Some good research does take a long time, and very good research is worth waiting for. But open research, open scholarship, challenges us to engage with our fellow scholars much earlier in the research process. That's for two reasons, I think. First, open scholarship is designed to accelerate research, inspiring others to adopt new methods, explore new subjects and reuse available data where that's appropriate. And then secondly, open scholarship throughout the life of the project should improve research methods and results as each stage of the project receives feedback and review. Conferences, online and in-person, offer opportunities to, for scholars to share preliminary findings, to answer questions and receive feedback. Are there other ways we can engage with fellow scholars during the research project process as well as afterwards? Perhaps one way scholars in the humanities and arts can participate more fully in open research is to consider publishing more and different kinds of research outputs. There's certainly a variety of options available, I looked at uh, five major publishers and discovered at least 37 types of research publication available across those five publishers. Uh, here's a list here. Now, not all journals will offer all of these options, of course, and indeed many will only offer a handful. Not all journals are open access, of course, either. So some of these publications might appear in traditional subscription journals, as well as open access ones. Still, there's enough variety here to offer scientists the opportunity to publish almost every possible research output. This allows researchers to engage with one another throughout the research process, from initial concept through the design of the project and, and data collection, to the analysis of findings and the review of potential applications and impact. But the system was certainly developed to suit research projects in the sciences, as were most of the article types on this list. These publications might capture scientists' research outputs, but do they really reflect research in the humanities? Let's imagine a research project um, in the humanities, perhaps one looking at how museum visitors of different ages engage with classical antiquities. I should say that I am not a specialist in archaeology or cultural heritage, so please excuse my imagination if some of the details here are more believable than others. 
the researcher of this project intends to publish a monograph at the end of her uh, research period. How might she capture some of the outputs from her project? And what are the benefits of doing so? First, we can create a stylized template of her research project, beginning with the concept and planning stages, followed by a period of data collection. When most of her information is recorded, she begins analyzing her findings and writing up results. If our researcher is anything like me, she also returns to the subject regularly after this, reflecting on her discoveries, the reception of her work, its societal impact, and how her conclusions are affected by new scholarship in the field. The primary outputs for this research project uh, are probably going to include a monograph, and our researcher might also choose to publish a research article in addition or instead, depending on the scope of her, of her studies. Even before that though, she might consider writing a review, a book review, a survey of literature, or an analysis of data sets, like surveys available on her subject. Not only would this offer an excellent opportunity to study current research in the field, it would allow her to engage in constructive scholarly debate, map out the parameters of her project within existing research, the existing research landscape, and perhaps discover some new sources of data she could reuse in her own project. Reviews also offer a great introduction to the publishing process for early career researchers. As her project progresses a little further, our researcher begins working on a series of surveys to gather information from museum visitors. All these survey results, and indeed the surveys themselves, constitute valuable data. She could choose to share this data in any of a number of ways. A data note uh, or data report is a short publication that allows researchers to describe the data they've collected, contextualize it, and explain how to access it. Uh, this allows it to be easily found and understood by other scholars. It's a great way for our researcher to publicize her project, the data her project generates, and to ship and she shares it in her institution's data repository. This will enable her reviewers later on to access and review the data she's generated alongside the articles or monograph that she writes. Our researcher is also lucky enough to have two research assistants working with her to create the surveys and collect results. They also help to write the data note and they are credited as co-authors along with our researcher. This is uh, the case even though they move on to other projects before the monograph has even begun. This is perhaps a more transparent and more accurate way of crediting contributions to research than a mention in the acknowledgments of the book that appears three to five years later. Similarly, once the surveys have been field tested and refined and the researcher and her postdocs uh, are happy with them, they decide to publish a method article, a methodology, outlining the survey's purpose, development, testing, and preliminary results. The methodology also notes how the research project will record, analyze, store, and share the information generated by the surveys. The surveys and our researchers' own observational reports have generated a couple of interesting findings around how very young children relate to a particular collection of antiquities that were designed for children or that show uh, depictions of children. Our researcher follows up these initial observations with some targeted research and additional interviews with children, uh, with um, children visiting the museum, their parents, teachers, and some of the museum engagement profes professionals. She decides to publish this subset of her research as a case study. A brief report might also work in this context, depending on the extent of her findings. Working with a digital humanities colleague, our researcher helped to design a program that creates visualizations of people playing ancient games using the antiquities at the museums in her project. She and her colleague made the software package available publicly and then published the software article to publicize their invention. Our researcher then developed a lesson plan and supplementary resources based on her research into the collections and the software package. 
she published these as open access curriculum and pedagogical tools. Our researcher has now reached the end of the data collection and analysis phases of her project, and she begins to write up the major part of her research findings. She completes her monograph, and it's accepted by her university press for publication in a uh, well-regarded series dedicated to cultural heritage projects. In writing the monograph, she was able to cite the methodology, the data and data note, the case study, software tool article, and pedagogical tools she'd already published. The reviewers of her monograph were also able to access these items, which made it much easier for them to evaluate her work. When the monograph is published, a prominent arts funding agency asks our researcher to join a panel looking at how to better support engagement with the arts across the life course. She and her colleagues on the panel use some of our researchers' findings to inform the policy brief they write about evaluating and supporting inclusive engagement activities at museums and galleries. She goes on to write an opinion piece on funding for engagement activities. Incidentally, all these published outputs count as publications on our researcher's record. Along with the monograph and initial grant funding, these publications are a meaningful part of our scholar's research record, helping her earn future academic promotion and additional funding. Now, this is obviously a hypothetical project and I designed it to fit the purposes of this talk. Not every research project will produce all of these outputs and that's perfectly appropriate, but I hope it shows how many options there are for researchers to share and to publish the outputs of their research in the arts and humanities. If any of these earlier outputs are open access, or better yet, open data, then other scholars will be able to engage more constructively and meaningfully with the process and results of the research. I may or may not have convinced you, but perhaps another quick poll will tell. Here's the list of research outputs from earlier, along with our major humanities outputs. Are there any here that you might consider for your next project? Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, if the next poll will show that I've convinced anyone of anything at all. Which publication types from, uh, oh, I guess I can't share two screens at once. Uh, which publication types um, might you consider? for your next research project in the arts and humanities. Video article, that's excellent. So a few answers coming through and I'll leave that up uh, for a moment or two um, as you consider your responses. Data note, that's great. Amy, is there a way that we can see the, the, the yes, results? Yes, I'm just wondering if I can do that. So, um, I think I can. I'm actually seeing what people are putting in. Uh, there we go. Does that show you the results? I've only got two so far. Ah, there we go. Yep, can see that. So definitely monograph is still on the list, but policy brief uh, from someone is considering along with data notes, data reports, video article, software tool. Thank you for putting the link in again. Uh, so at least there are a few more options than there were before. Uh, right, on that note, I will turn the floor over to you for questions. Thanks, Amy. That was really interesting. Uh, would anyone like to ask questions? If you just close your screen sharing, Amy, then I think we'll yeah. be able to see the 
gallery of participants. We'll attempt to do that. There we go. Great. Can I just ask, um, as someone who's not, who's maybe a bit naive about uh, publishing side of things, uh, that really interesting research cycle that you laid out, to what extent is that possible with the traditional academic publishers? You know, or is it only possible through open access services? Uh, certainly some traditional publishers offer some of these uh, types of publications. Um, probably the most common uh, would be reviews of one type or another, book reviews, certainly literature reviews. Um, and then also um, methodologies or method articles are generally common in uh, subscription journals as well. Um, I think it would be fair to say, though, that uh, one of the things that open access um, publishers excel at is these uh, uh, alternative article types. Certainly at F1000, um, we've, uh, we've made a specialty of some of them, um, like Genome Notes, which is a new one we've just intro introduced along with policy briefs. Uh, so I think I, um, for many researchers, particularly in the humanities, it might be um, kind of a combination of traditional subscription journals, and then also looking for opportunities perhaps to, um, to try some of these other article types with open access if possible. Uh, we have a question from Melody. Hi, thank, thank you so much for that, Amy. I was just curious, um, how do you sort of envision scholars being able to sort of curate all of these disparate pieces into sort of a narrative. So if I were to wait until I did my monograph, admittedly an open access monograph, I could kind of weave all of these elements together into one cohesive um, element. If there are lots of little pieces all over the place, how, how do scholars link them up together in, in a cohesive way, as opposed to just saying, here's a list of footnotes of relevant research. I think it probably will depend a little bit on the project um, that, that you're working on. Some projects do seem to work out to always seem like a series of case studies, and then you put them together because there's a, a kind of overarching theme. Um, and, and others do have a, a more cohesive kind of beginning, middle and end to, to the narrative, in, in which case, um, you know, some of these other formats may not be as applicable. Um, but I think one thing that that this does allow you to do is, is to, um, to think about the different parts of a project um, as related but independent. So you can, you can think about the societal impact of your research um, and, uh, and take some time to really reflect on, on how you, you might create an actionable policy based on your research into a particular area. And that might not easily fit into the monograph that you're, that you're writing. So I think um, rather than changing the narrative of the monograph, it allows you to explore some of the um, kind of side alleys and avenues that you might not be able to take um, in that monograph. Thank you. I was also uh, interested at one point in your talk, you talked about some of the perceived advantages of an open access publishing model. And I'm wondering if that is, is quantifiable in any way, or is that the kind of, is there, do, do publishers try and record this kind of data and try and um, you know, use it as a, as a USP to attract people, for example? Sure, absolutely. Um, th there's a lot of research on this. Um, we, we in fact have a, um, a gateway which I manage, which is dedicated to research on research. That is how we conduct, publish, and um, and evaluate research. Uh, and what and this is definitely one of the subjects um, those articles look at. Uh, open access um, books and articles tend to be read more often, and that makes sense because people can access them. They do often tend to be cited more often too, um, and uh, the the sort of percentage of increase in citations is, is debatable, but it's between 10 and 25% perhaps, um, depending on the field. Uh, so certainly this is, uh, 
this is an advantage, both um, in terms of publicizing your research and also, of course, for um, valuations, uh, if that's uh, a concern. Um, but I think there are other advantages too, and, um, and there may be less quantifiable and more qualitative. Um, open peer review, like the kind that we have at F1000, um, is designed to promote improvements in research and to engage scholars in a dialogue rather than a kind of stop-go decision. This is meant to be a, um, a discussion of research and, and an improvement of it. Um, and that can be an advantage, I think, um, for scholars looking for a different kind of way to engage with their peers. Yeah, I like the way you imagined it as a more of a process rather than publishing events. And that's quite inspiring. Yeah. Uh, If there aren't any more questions, I think we'll take another five minute break. Uh, thanks again, Amy, for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, so, so we'll return at half past two um, with uh, Dr. Rose harris Bertel. Okay. Hello again, everybody. Uh, we're ready to go with the final presentation for the session today. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Rose Harris Bertel, who's, who's based at Birkbeck. And uh, she's the acting director and managing editor of the Open Library of Humanities there. Over to you, Rose. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, can everybody see and hear me OK so far? Shout if you can't hear this. Fantastic. OK, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming um, and staying on for today's final talk of the day. So it's a pleasure to be joining you, uh, albeit virtually. And thank you so much to Mike Kelly and the UKRN for inviting me to speak today. Um, I also want to say thank you to Melody and Amy for their fascinating talks and perspectives earlier. It's really great to be able to pick up um, and extend, I think, today's conversation with my talk this afternoon. 
So I'm here from the Open Access Journal publisher, the Open Library of Humanities, or OLH. And today I'm going to give an insider's overview on open access publishing, how the OLH works, and some of the benefits and challenges of open access publishing in the humanities. Now, in particular, I'm going to be drawing on my experiences of open access journal publishing in my roles as director and managing editor across a suite of 28 open access humanities journals and editor of our flagship journal, OLH. OK, so before I begin, it's worth saying here that I'm not assuming any prior knowledge of open access publishing or the OLH for this. So I'm going to start with a kind of general overview. Now, the Open Library of Humanities is an open access academic publisher. It's based in the Department of English, Theatre and Creative Writing at Birkbeck University of London. Now, launched in 2015, the OLH is a charitable scholar led organisation dedicated to publishing peer reviewed open access scholarship in humanities. Uh, we're a not for profit publisher and all of our journals are both free to read and free to access. Now, our mission is to support and extend open access to scholarship in the humanities for free, for everyone, forever. Now, in today's talk, when I refer to open access, I'm referring to peer reviewed research that's free to read online with no charges to access or to read, with some permissions granted for use. However, it's also worth briefly summarising some of the different types of open access here, is there are quite a few different ways that content can be made more widely available as open access, and they're all quite distinct. So gold open access refers to when the author or publisher makes content free to access at its source. There's also green open access, and that's when existing research is deposited at an institutional or a subject repository. So, for example, an accepted manuscript that's deposited on a university's own research portal for all to access. Now, some journals can be gold open access, so where there's no charges for readers, so you can read the article for free. But they pass the publication costs on to authors using a pay to publish model in the form of a mandatory article processing charge. Now, this is a fee that's charged to the author to publish their work as a condition of publication. Now, because of this, there's also another category, sometimes called diamond or platinum open access, which refers to when articles are both free to publish and free to read, like LH. There's also black open access, uh, which refers to unauthorized open access that breaches copyright on the work itself. And I've just included this as well to show that open access can be many different things in different contexts. Okay, well, why is open access publishing so important? Well, OA publishing has some enormous benefits and challenges ahead. We live in a globally unequal publishing climate with pay to publish systems reliant on article processing charges that favour institutions and subjects that can afford them, effectively penalising researchers without access to sufficient funding. Open access humanities publishing also faces difficult field specific challenges compared to scientific publishing. Now, without the substantially larger budgets that are available for scientific research, Paying costly open article process, uh, costly open access article processing charges, and these can easily be a thousand pounds or more, is far more difficult for humanities researchers, creating a culture which favours closed access, pay to read publishing models. Now, to give an example here, um, JISC data on open access costs for 2014 to 15 calculates average article processing charges at one thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds per article. Now, as such, there are huge benefits to be had from free to publish, free to read open access models. In an era of budget cuts, free access to scholarship helps researchers and students alike, as well as those unable to reach works in financially or geographically inaccessible locations, those working with travel or budget constraints and individuals living with disabilities that prevent physical access to texts. Now, public access to research also brings wider societal benefits. We live in an age of information, but as we're seeing, it's also an age of misinformation. Universities might include in their mission statements that their work should benefit society, 
but the research that they produce for public good is not always available to that public, even when publicly funded. Now, open access publication can help to redress this balance by making rigorous scholarship truly accessible to all. And with institutional lockdowns and entire populations quarantined, as we've seen over the past 18 months, open access to knowledge is perhaps more important than ever before. Now, for those of us working on or with open access, an awareness of the work that still needs to be done on a global scale can be quite daunting. Local barriers to implementation, whether economic or practical, can take time, resources and sustained effort to overcome. Now, even though there's been commendable efforts of transnational coordination with initiatives such as Plan S, as Martin Eve notes, at present, the economic challenges of the shifts to both gold and green open access are amplified by the fact that there is no unified global response. So we might agree that there are huge global benefits to be had from increasing open access, but how do we get there? Well, let's have a look at what the OLH does. Well, the Open Library of Humanities was established to find a sustainable business model to make humanities research accessible to anyone across the globe. Initially funded by grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the European Commission, the major challenge was to achieve financial independence with a business model based on collective contributions. Now, the OLH is funded by an international consortium of libraries who each contribute an annual membership. And rates are banded according to the institution's size and they're deliberately kept low, so around a thousand pounds a year uh, to ensure affordability with lower rates for smaller institutions and different geographical locations. Now, our subscribing institutions form an international community of over 300 supporting members from some 20 countries. Joining entitles the member to a voting position on the Library Governance Board with the ability to vote on the inclusion of new journals, allowing the OLH to be collaboratively governed by its supporters. We also really encourage other organisations to learn from and build on what we've achieved and use our model as the basis of their own open access frameworks. Now, with this business model, in six years, the OLH has established a platform of 28 peer-reviewed journals whose scholarly articles have received over half a million downloads worldwide. We now have five full-time staff. We fund two external commercial university presses to convert their own journals to open access. And we've developed Janeway, which is our own open access publishing software, which we've built in-house and we encourage others to use freely. Now, my own experiences of the day-to-day -day running of the OLH have been overwhelmingly positive. I'm really fortunate to work with a brilliant and very hardworking team, uh, as well as some incredibly dedicated editors from around the globe who've put in a huge amount of time and care to move their journals to open access. So it's in light of this that I'd like to share my experiences from inside an open access publisher. The OLH may be just one organisation, but it's my hope that collectively sharing information on best practices and working together on open access can contribute to real change. Now at OLH, uh, being a small team allows us to implement changes far more rapidly and responsively than large companies. So for example, we've invested in improvements for our publishing software to ensure accessibility for a wider range of people with disabilities, as well as making it compatible with major publishing software systems to make it easier for journals to join us. The OLH team also work online using a virtual workspace that effectively allows us to work from anywhere in the world. And this helps to keep overheads low and it allows us to work flexibly. So when the pandemic hit, we were able to continue without disruption to our working practices. Meetings with editors are conducted virtually uh, across international borders and time zones, which again, saves costs compared to large publishers. Now, developing Janeway as our own open source publishing software has been a really important milestone in the growth of the OLH as having our own not-for-profit scholarly publishing platform has enabled us to publish our own journals in-house. 
Now, Chainway is an open source platform and it's openly licensed, which means that the software is actually free for anyone to use and modify so long as they make their own changes similarly open. Now, Janeway has been hugely successful, uh, is proven particularly popular with our editors who consistently tell us that they really appreciate having more direct fingertip control over the publishing process. And it makes publishing journals much faster and more responsive without needing to go through a costly third party supplier. We get feedback directly from our editors and authors, and we constantly update and develop the platform to meet their needs. We actually have two dedicated software developers that work on this full time. Now, because Janeway was developed in the open, anyone can send in feature suggestions. And it's also useful for extra revenue generation because it offers hosting for journals, preprints and presses, which helps to pay the staffing costs for its developers. So what has the OLH achieved then? Let's take a look at the OLH in numbers. Well, in 2020, so last year was with nearly 300 institutions participating uh, and paying in an annual fee each of between uh, 988 to $2,500. We published 531 open access articles, and this was at a base cost of around $500 per article. And that effectively cost each institution around $3 per article, so it's about £2.20. So while one of the benefits of this model is being able to spread publishing costs more fairly, a potential challenge here is why would supporters pay for something that's going to be free anyway? Well, this is a really good question, um, but we're finding that as institutions are increasingly being asked to evidence their support of open access beyond the minimum requirements, this is a really cost effective way for them to do so, because for less than the cost of a single article processing charge, they can become part of an international governance board of open access journals. Now, another challenge is carefully managing resources to ensure that things can be run efficiently for the benefit of all. Uh, this means having to turn down applications. We receive more applications from academic journals wanting to transition to open access than we could ever take on. However, we've actually recently reopened to journal applications from subscription journals wanting to move to open access, which we're really excited about. So we're currently calling for paid for journals to flip to join OLH and become fully open access. Now, according to the latest data available across all 28 OLH titles up to the end of last year, OLH articles have been downloaded over half a million times to date. Uh, and in 2020, we saw a 42% increase in the number of article downloads compared to the year before and a 19% increase in the number of total website views across those articles, which is a significant rise in the number of people viewing research online. So from this perspective, then access to open access is certainly growing. I'm also delighted to be able to say that the OLH is now a multi-award winning publisher. We've been awarded a Coco Foundation Open Publishing Award. Um, we've been highly commended in the ALPSP Awards for innovation in publishing and recently won an AOP Digital Publishing Award as well. So we've managed to achieve, I think, quite a lot in open access publishing with just five uh, members of staff in six years. So let's have a look at humanities research in the OLH. Well, the OLH journals span the humanities covering subjects as diverse as literature, architecture, history, ethnology, archeology, span linguistics, comics, films, poetry, and theater. Now, Glossa, which is a journal of general linguistics, is our largest journal, and that published 132 articles in 2020, or roughly two to three articles a week. Uh, and this journal, previously known as Lingua, actually made the national press for flipping to open access in 2015, when the entire editorial board simultaneously reside, uh, resigned from its paid publisher, Elsevier, in order to join OLH. Now, the OLH also publishes the journals of several learned societies, including Marvell Studies, which is the journal of the Andrew Marvell Society, uh, the Journal of the British Association of Film and Television Studies, and C21 Literature, which is the Journal of the British Association of Contemporary Literary Studies. 
our flagship journal, OLH, publishes open access special collections, which are curated special editions led by experts in the field from across the humanities. Now, these special collections have proven particularly popular for scholars looking for a home for a special edition on a bespoke topic that they would like to be made openly accessible to all. We actually have uh, over 30 special collections now in the journal, each uh, guest edited by academics who have applied to curate open access special editions in their field. And you can see some of our OLH journal special collections here. Uh, our collections include topics on specialist academic subjects from Muslims in media to the medieval brain. And guest editors have complete oversight over their collections from calls to papers to acceptance and articles are published as soon as they're ready. So in 2020, our submission to publication time across the journal was 298 days. So around nine months from start to finish on average and 59 days from acceptance to publication. So accepted papers were published in an average time of just under two months. Now, one of the benefits of open access publishing is that things can move far more quickly than with traditional print journals. And it's also easier to demonstrate the reach of the research using the, statistic, uh, the statistics collected, as well as help get the biggest readership for your research as possible. And in a funding climate where humanities researchers are increasingly having to justify every penny spent on their research, such local data allows researchers to prove that open access works. Now, if we look at a recently published article from our flagship journal, OLH, you can see what the final output looks like here. Now, this shows the two versions of each published article. So one is the web display version on the left, and then we have the more traditional typeset PDF on the front page um, of the article on the right. And both of these are identical, but I'm just including them as sometimes in open access publishing, people can assume that there won't be a sort of professional finish or a typeset PDF at the end. There, there always is with us. So all articles show the number of views and the number of downloads. Uh, they show the dates of submission, acceptance and publication. Uh, they show the Creative Commons license info, um, and they also show how to cite the article while the PDFs are professionally copy edited and typeset to create the final polished look of the article. Now, uh, here we're talking about uh, journal publishing, and we're looking at an example of an open access journal article, but it's also worth saying something briefly about open access academic monographs. Now, as an open access publisher, we're often asked, why doesn't the OLH also publish books? After all, we've demonstrated the business model works really quite well for journals. However, we don't currently publish monographs for several reasons. The OLH was set up to apply a sustainable business model tailored specifically for journal article publishing. An integral part of the OLH is that our scholarship is always free to read and free to publish. And this is possible on the scale of journal articles, but many open access monograph models currently require substantial book processing charges in order to cover the much larger costs involved in publishing a book. Now, this can mean that only those who can find the funds to cover this can get their work published, which runs counter to our core mission. However, if anyone's interested in work being done in open access monograph publishing, I'd recommend looking up the COPIM project. So COPIM, C-O-P-I-M, uh, and that stands for Community-Led Open Publication Infrastructures for Monographs. And that's an open access book initiative, and that's being worked on by the OLH founder, Professor Martin Eve. Well, I'll finish up here, but hopefully that's been a useful overview of the Open uh, uh, Library of Humanities and Open Access Publishing. And thank you so much for listening, and I'd be very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rose. That was brilliant. And uh, it's a really inspiring success story, I think. Um, just looking to see if anyone is raising their hands. Nick in the chat asks if you could say a bit more about flipping. Yes, I, I absolutely could. And I'm delighted that you asked. Thank you very much, Nick. 
Um, so journal flipping is basically what we what we call the process of getting a um, paid for journal, so a subscription journal that people would usually have to pay to access and making it open access. So we're flipping it from essentially a closed access journal to an open one. And uh, this is something that we get approached about. We have been approached about for many years in that people will um, come to the end of the line with their paid for publisher and perhaps the editorial board aren't happy with having restricted access or the for profit nature of their work. Again, remembering that many um, academic journals work on free labour and so academics are uh, giving their time volunteering, not necessarily receiving anything in return uh, and so want to transition to open access. So uh, we recently launched, um, I think this was just a few months ago, uh, a campaign to raise some more funds to allow us to help more journals with access. And uh, we have had a, an amazing response, uh, essentially from supporters who want to donate money. So this is institutions who want to sign up to one of our higher tier levels, specifically for a pot of money that's just used to flip um, journals to open access. So the high tier supporters can join at a bronze, silver or gold level. It's just a slightly larger amount uh, if they wish to contribute that specially to flip journals. And we opened this a few months ago to see how this would go and if there would be enough funds. And actually it's been massively successful. Um, so we have just been able to reopen to applications for expressions of interest for uh, journals from academics or, uh, that are currently with paid for publishers or subscription based journals that want to transition to open access. And the mission there is we want to try and make knowledge as widely accessible as possible and uh, expand the portfolio of open access journals so that we can help as many different uh, journals and as much knowledge reach the public as possible. So if you're interested in this, uh, I'll also find the um, our link to this and pop it in the chat. If you know anybody who is working at um, or for a journal with a, a sort of closed access model that would desperately like to move to open access, uh, we are taking applications. Um, but yes, thank you very much for that question. Nick. Could I also ask, um... You know, bearing in mind your success, are you seeing other people trying to follow the same model and or are you seeing um, an effect on the, the commercial publishers you know, when they're aware of your different, the different approach that you're taking and some of the yeah. success that you've been having with it? That's a that's a, a very good a very good question. I'm just po posting this is the link by the way in the chat to the news on flipping journals to open access so the details if anybody would like to share that with anyone. Um, so uh, absolutely, we strongly encourage people to follow what we're doing, to share knowledge. Um, our mission statement is to try and ensure the accessibility of knowledge for free for everyone forever as broadly as possible. So unlike sort of commercial models, which are, can be kept quite secret, we really want open access to go as far as possible. Um, and we've had some success in seeing other publishers actually uh, update their models, try and move to collective funding models and make those work, um, which is brilliant. Um, we're often contacted actually for talks or just informal chats for people wanting to try and do this kind of work and set up these kind of organisations. So um, that's excellent. And I mean, you know, it was brilliant that you, you reached out to me to speak today because we really, you know, this kind of advocacy is really important for what we do because we're not just there to just kind of walk the walk for you know our portfolio of 28 open access journals but we really actually want to try and extend open access to scholarship as far as possible um, so we also do editorial outreach as part of this um, we've got our uh, olh open access award which is a fund that's used to help open access fledgling projects from around the world um, to help try and kind of kick start a little bit more um, open access projects that are going on in different places um, we've recently just taken on our first intern who's passionate about open access publishing. Um, we're trying to sort of help in as many different ways as we can. And we're always very willing to take any suggestions or feedback on how we can do that further. So, yeah, we, we desperately, <laughs> we, we really want to make change in the field as broadly as we can. Um, and we are honoured when, when people build on what we've been doing and, and take it forward in their own way. 
Amy, you had a question. Yes, uh, it's really interesting to hear. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if um, OLH, or perhaps it's on a on a journal by journal basis, do you engage with open data uh, as a as a concept with your editors and authors? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think it really depends on the journals themselves as to how much open data is part of their own um, kind of backyard. I mean, in the humanities, it's not really something that comes in. So I'm the editor of the Open Library of Humanities flagship journal, and it's not something that we generally get because people aren't dealing with huge amounts of data that they're similarly wanting to make open as part of their research. Um, but yes, that's certainly something that's incredibly important. I think it's seen less in the humanities rather than in the sciences and the social sciences um, in terms of sort of openness more broadly. So, for example, um, I mentioned Way, our scholarly publishing platform, uh, which is completely open source and which we encourage people to use. Um, as part of that, we also have made our publishing templates, so article publishing templates, so the layout that I showed um, of what our articles look like. We've made those open source as well, um, so that any small publishers, any small journals that actually can't afford a designer to design them a nice article template, we've made those open as well. So yes, open data is something that obviously we certainly encourage as part of that is just subject wise, not something we see a lot at the um, OLH journal, but that's because a lot of our papers are on, you know, literature and um, poetry and history and so on, rather than kind of intense data set kind of studies. But yeah, I hope I hope that helps to answer your question a little bit. Thank you. We probably have time for about one more question. Uh, I'll pass over to you, Melody. So I don't want to take it away if somebody else has a question, but um, this is 90% for Rose, but maybe Amy would jump in as well. Um, the, I know you have the flagship journal, obviously, and, and all the separate journals. Do you find people are loyal to individual journals or are we moving to a system where people are just searching for the article they want and and where it's where it is is where it is 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 the is the journal relationship more with the author than with the reader i guess is what i'm i'm saying that is a brilliant question really interesting so i think um particularly with the transition to open access so i think we previously had a sort of setup pre widespread open access where people would be much more wedded to a specific journal you know your work has to come out in that journal and that's that but some of these more traditional long established journals that perhaps haven't um, made their work open access were increasingly finding that um, research funders for example are wanting an open access component of the output of the researchers work so for example if that can't be with a particularly um, prestigious closed access journal we're finding that authors actually are sort of acting more like consumers in that way and actually going well where do I strategically want to put my work um, similarly when it comes to so our OLH special collections that I mentioned um, those are brilliant for um, editors or, or sort of specialists that have a specific idea or theme in mind and perhaps their traditional journal goes no our issues are planned for the next three years we can't afford to put any more in or this is a bit too interdisciplinary for us and so our, our kind of special collections were set up to kind of help um, researchers in the position of look I've got this great idea I've got this brilliant collection I know some scholars that will do it we've you know we've done a, a conference on this there's enough interest but I can't quite find somewhere that, that will do it open access and so they come to us and we'll publish their kind of special collection so I think that's also a really interesting way that people are moving away from the sort of traditional long established, you know, stick with a single name in the field and that's it. And actually branching out to see what other options are there because they are taking sort of more charge, if you like, of their research outputs and want to make things open access. And that's I think, really nice to see. Thank you. Well, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, so I think we should wrap things up. Um, I just want to thank the speakers again for sharing their insights and experience. And uh, I think I learned a lot from that today. Um, it was kind of a workshop of two halves, I thought, and we covered quite a, a wide range of bases.
which shows that maybe this subject is one that should be revisited again in the future. And there's a lot to talk about. Um, thanks a lot to UKRN for supporting this uh, session and making it possible in the first place. And thanks to everyone who came along and thanks for your contributions. Hopefully we'll have another event uh, on, along similar lines in future and hope to see you all then. Okay, so bye for now. Thanks, bye.